who film multiple versions of their character's ending? Which character have people been calling to get their own spin-off series? Did Happy Valley get the ending the series deserved? Keep watching and we'll cover these questions and more in this video. Welcome to Square Eyes, a channel where we recap, review and take a sideways look at your favourite TV shows. This video will be taking a look at the sixth and final episode of Series 3 of Happy Valley. The BBC iPlayer summarises this episode by saying scores are settled for good on Catherine's final shift and Ryan faces a moral dilemma, which is a nice teaser for the episode, but doesn't say a great deal. My recap covers the whole episode in full detail. Let's jump straight in. The episode opens with Catherine sleeping on Alice and Garth's sofa in her flat. As she's coming round, she reaches down for her scarf and picks up a packet of pills that have fallen under the sofa. She asks Alison about the pills and finds out they belong to a feckless probation officer, who is obtaining illegal prescription medication from somewhere and has even offered to get some for Alison too. Catherine, despite only having a few hours sleep and many other problems, can't help but see a lead and asks Alison to find out more about where her probation officer gets the pills. Then we see Ivan and Matea getting ready for Ivan's big day. His much talked about wedding is finally about to happen. They've also got £30,000 in cash that they stole from their bosses. None of it matters though, because all their hopes and dreams are in tatters as the police raid their house and arrest the pair of them. Ivan doesn't protest his innocence as he's having his rights read to him. Instead he insists that they can't arrest him because he's getting married in two hours, which sadly falls on deaf ears and they arrest him anyway. How cruel. They were arrested for false imprisonment, money laundering and assisting Tommy Lee Royce escaping lawful custody. But they're lucky not to have crimes against wallpaper added to their charge sheet, looking at the state of their bedroom. And the fashion police might have something to say about Ivan's shiny wedding suit too. Catherine picks Ryan up and takes him down to the station so they can talk to him about his recent contact with Tommy Lee Royce on his prison visits, not realising that he's been in touch with him far more recently through his video game chat system. On the way through the station they bump into Detective Superintendent Andy Shepard and he asks Ryan about his opinion on Rob Hepworth. Ryan mentions that Hepworth is a bit creepy with him and has talked about his troubles in his marriage during their private chat recently, which Shepard is keen to get down in a statement from Ryan to help with the investigation. Cheliko Konezovic, Darius's brother and two of his goons turn up at Tommy Lee Royce's safe house and say he needs to be moved. They tell Tommy to travel in the boot of the car, but he refuses and says he'll travel inside the car with his hood up instead. They don't like this, but they reluctantly agree. Tommy is obviously suspicious of these guys, and this is made worse when he sees a can of petrol in the footwell of the car. While there may be a harmless explanation for it, he'd be excused for thinking that they were planning on setting fire to the car with him locked in the boot. He tells them that he's left his inhaler back in the house and needs to go get it, but actually heads back inside to find himself a weapon. He can sense a trap and wants to be prepared for a fight. Tommy takes the knife that the old man was chopping beetroot with in the last episode and hides it up his sleeve. I find it interesting that he doesn't just run away from them at this point, as it seems pretty obvious that these three men intend to try and kill him. But I suppose Tommy Lee Royce is a psychopath and will fancy his chances of coming out on top of this situation. When Tommy gets back to the car, Jellico tells him to sit in the front seat, but Tommy rejects the suggestion and says he'll be sitting in the back seat. This makes the Knezovich brother angry. But Tommy's right, he's a lot more visible in the front seat, and he's an escaped convict. Plus, anyone that's ever watched a gangster film will know that sitting in the front seat with a henchman behind you means you're very likely to get strangled to death. Again, the gangsters reluctantly agree to Tommy's demands, but being an awkward customer and insisting on getting his own way, he's quickly established his dominance in this situation, and shown that he won't be pushed around by them. He also tries to start chatting to the silent man he's sat next to, but gets no answer. I suspect this is all partly mind games, and partly him trying to better understand the situation that he's up against. Ryan is in the police interview room and being asked questions about his contact with Tommy Lee Royce and he tells the investigators about the conversation he had on his games console the night before. I love the little look up that they give when he mentions this, as though they're saying, oh interesting tell us more, but inside they'll be punching the air because they've got a massive breakthrough on the case. After leaving the last episode unsure what Ryan would do, it's a relief to see that he's decided to turn his dad into the police, even if he waited until the middle of the next morning to tell anyone about it. Back in the car, Tommy keeps asking questions of Jellico and gets flaky responses about what's going to happen next. It's pretty obvious that they're planning to kill him, and Tommy smells a rat. Rather than wait for them to strike first, Tommy takes the initiative, and stabs Marco, who sat next to him, in the tummy, strangles Victor in front of him with a seatbelt, and then slits both men's throats. It's a spectacular show of swift and decisive violence, that means Jellico no longer has the numerical advantage, and it's him versus Tommy. Jellico swerves the car off the road and into a field. Catherine's been made to wait for her retirement meeting with the chief constable, and in the end decides it's not worth a hassle and walks off. Catherine's consistently shown a complete lack of respect for the top brass throughout her career, so it makes complete sense that she wouldn't sit around waiting to see him, no matter how important he is, particularly when she's got so many other problems to solve. Back in the field, Jellico jumps out of the moving car, leaving Tommy and the two dying men in an out-of-control vehicle. Tommy manages to bring it to a stop, and then the two men engage in a brutal fight to the death, with knives, fists, and ultimately a big rock that Tommy conveniently finds lying next to his hand. Tommy wins the fight and brutally finishes off Jellico Knezovic, seeming to enjoy the extreme violence and carrying on his attacks past the point they were needed. 
He's badly wounded from the battle, though, and has a stab wound in his side among several other nasty-looking cuts. As he's coming round, a clunky flashback from his conversation with Ryan the night before reminds us and him that Catherine's house is empty at the moment, which makes it the perfect place for him to go and lick his wounds. While Catherine is attending to her daughter's grave, she's visited by her daughter, who gives her a cuddle from behind. This isn't the first time that we've seen Becky's ghostly presence in Happy Valley, but it's the first time that she's been a comforting and welcome appearance. Previously, her arrival has been horrifying to Catherine, but at this moment, she's relieved to feel her daughter's presence. She whispers, go home, into her mother's ear, and Catherine goes back to her house, despite the multiple warnings she's received to stay away until Royce has been captured. She looks through old family photos, looking back at those of Becky growing up and heartbreakingly ending up blank pages, where there would have been more if she hadn't have died so young. Then she looks at pictures of Ryan as he's grown up and falls asleep in the chair, exhausted. While Catherine sleeps in the front room, Tommy breaks into the cellar, expecting the house to be empty because Ryan said they'd been told to stay away. Catherine is seconds from coming face to face with Tommy, but Ryan calls her to ask to be picked up from the station, so she leaves, grabbing the keys from the kitchen table seconds before Tommy comes through the door that leads down to the cellar. Then we see Andy Shepard reviewing the evidence that they have for Joanna's murder. They have lots of evidence of Rob's historic abuse of his wife, so it looks bad for the PE teacher, who they bring in for an interview. He doesn't hold up well under interrogation, looking as guilty as sin as he flanders under the investigator's questions. A key piece of evidence is a bloody fingerprint which matches Joe's blood and Rob's finger. Rob struggles to explain, but we know this is most likely from one of his regular wife beatings rather than a murder. Faisal finds out that Ivan and Matea have been arrested, and you can see him playing a game of 3D chess in his mind trying to work out the implications for his situation. It's good news because the thugs that have been extorting money from him are now in custody, but it's bad news because they might blab about his legal prescription pills operation. Ryan opens up to Catherine about his feelings about Tommy's offer to go to Marbella, and Anne Gallagher's rant the night before. He says that his aunt has been there for him all along. Catherine dismisses what Ryan says initially, but after a while you can see that his words have made an impact, and it looks like Catherine might be considering forgiving her sister. Tommy's hiding in Catherine's house, and he's looking in a very bad way. He finds the photo albums that Catherine had out earlier, and he enjoys seeing Ryan growing up, but when he finds the old pictures of Becky, he breaks down in tears. Then we see the full extent of his injury from the knife wound, and it looks like he's in serious trouble if he doesn't get medical attention soon. Harry's tears out of regret for what he did to Becky. Genuine love for her, or just self-pity because he knows he's in a bad way. I find it hard to believe he's capable of real human emotions. Catherine goes back to Neverson Gallagher's house and has a chat with Claire. Things are still awkward between them, but it's clear that Catherine is trying to build bridges. She talks about how she shouldn't have been so scared of Ryan meeting Tommy Lee Royce, because Ryan's a good lad at heart and isn't going to turn out like his dad. Catherine gets a call from her neighbour Winnie, which must have been to notify her of a broken cellar window, as the next thing we know she's outside her house. Catherine then makes her way inside, without calling for backup, despite being aware that Tommy Lee Royce is most likely inside. In this moment, she's not acting as a rational police officer, though. She's acting as someone who wants to settle a score with their nemesis, so going in alone suits her, as it gives her more options to deal with Royce as she sees fit, rather than having to play it by the book. In the kitchen, Tommy is popping pills and necking whiskey like they're going out of fashion, and gobbles them in handfuls when he hears Catherine in the hallway. He's clearly decided that his injuries are too bad, and he's either facing a slow death or capture and a return to jail so he's taking things into his own hands and ending it quickly. Then Catherine and Tommy talk for a while, with Catherine keeping her taser drawn, but Tommy showing no signs of putting up a fight. Tommy tells Catherine that Darius Konezovich killed Gary Gagovsky, which he does as revenge after their partnership ended badly. Then he tries to shock Catherine by telling her about Ryan's prison visits, but she already knows. She tells him how she's pleased that Ryan went, as it was a chance to see Tommy for what he really is. The two end up arguing, and it quickly becomes clear that while Tommy has a natural talent for violence, he doesn't have any skill when it comes to articulating himself, and Catherine wipes the floor with him. The best he can say is when he tells Catherine that she is not very bright for saying that, which he says because he's run out of comebacks. Tommy then tells Catherine that he came to a realisation when he was looking through the photo albums, and he realised that she'd given Ryan a nice life. He tells her that he forgives her, like it's some big gesture, and Catherine reacts furiously, reminding Tommy of all the terrible things that he's done to her family. One of the key things they disagree on is whether Tommy loved Becky or not. He insists he did, but Catherine remembers the horrendous things he did to her and refuses to believe that he could have done. Earlier in the episode, he was crying over pictures of Becky, so maybe there was some feeling, but he's also an abusive person that can't help but hurt everyone that's close to him. He also blames everyone else for the things he's done wrong. When Tommy's had enough of talking, he covers himself in petrol and threatens to set fire to himself. He tells Catherine not to taser him, because he doesn't want her to get into trouble. Instead, he will set fire to himself. She tells him not to, but I'm not sure it's the most heartfelt plea to stop. Then Tommy actually carries through with his threat and sets himself on fire. Catherine puts him out with a blanket and the confrontation is over. Catherine walks calmly out of the building and holds it together as she walks past her fellow officers, 
but then ducks into a car park and crumples up in tears. Luckily, Claire comes along to comfort her, and the pair are able to properly be bonded back together again. Claire isn't even upset that Catherine has ruined one of her crochet blankets on putting out Tommy Lee Royce. With her trademark understatement, Catherine tells her sister that her and Tommy have had another bit of a tussle. I won, obviously. Then, with just four minutes left in the series and a host of loose ends to tie up, we go back to the station for Catherine's leaving presentation. While everyone else is eating cake, Catherine is clearing her desk. DSI Andy Shepard pops by and casually lets us know that Darius Knezovich has also been arrested and Tommy Lee Royce is currently in a coma. Then we find out that Rob Hepworth has been charged with having indecent images of children he teaches on his phone, which means his own children will now be taken care of by his grandparents. With a dead mother, a father in jail and grandparents raising them, these two girls' situations echo Ryan's at the start of Happy Valley. The quick-fire round of story resolution doesn't end there, though, as Catherine tells Shepard that Alison Garz has told her that Faisal is the one supplying her probation officer with dodgy pills, and he's a neighbour of the Hepworths. Shepard gives her a, K would you've done it again face, and scurries off to pursue this lead, suggesting Faisal isn't going to be a free man for much longer, and his wife's chances of getting that £15,000 decking like a sister are now looking slim. Catherine takes a look at the party in her honour, and instead of joining her colleagues, she leaves without saying goodbye, a manoeuvre I like to pull at parties too, called the French Exit. The final scene of the series shows her driving her now roadworthy and loaded up Land Rover up to the graveyard to tend to her daughter's grave. While she's there, she gets a text to say that Tommy Lee Royce has died. Then Catherine walks away to her Land Rover. Her work is now complete. I think this was a satisfying ending to the series, and I feel like we've now got enough closure to leave Happy Valley and its characters. This episode prioritised the main Catherine and Tommy storyline over the others, which meant we got some excellent scenes with them, but it left me feeling a bit short-changed with the other characters. The fight scene where Tommy got the better of Jellico Knezovic and his two henchmen was a brutal reminder of how dangerous Tommy can be. It was nasty and vicious, but he was almost certainly dead if he didn't take some sort of action, so there was a logic to it. The ending of his knife fight with Jellico relied on him conveniently finding a rock just within his grasp, when it seemed like he'd certainly lost the fight, which is a bit of a cliché, but otherwise I thought the action from that scene was well choreographed, particularly when you consider the BBC dramas don't have the same kind of budgets as big American productions. The really great moment in this episode was the final showdown between Catherine and Tommy in the kitchen, and rather than punches and kicks, it was words that were used to do the damage. After three seasons of Happy Valley, this was the longest time we spent with the two central characters on screen together, and it was worth waiting for. Both actors' performances were brilliant in this scene, and the writing was just right for the characters. I particularly liked how Sally Wainwright didn't overdo Tommy's lines in this scene. He's not a master criminal, he's a deranged psychopath, so he'd not be able to give eloquent speeches in these situations. So it made sense that his words got stuck, and he struggled to say things just how he wanted to. My biggest criticism of this episode was more about what was left out than anything that was included in it. Even with the extra ten minutes, there wasn't enough time to give all the various storylines a satisfying payoff, and given the extra emphasis they correctly gave to Catherine and Tommy, others fell by the wayside. So after carefully setting things up in the previous five episodes, we didn't even get to see Faisal be arrested. Rob was arrested for something we hadn't been made aware he was doing. Richard didn't even feature in the episode at all. Anne Gallagher and her struggles with PTSD were cast aside. Nevis and Gallagher's attempts to woo Catherine were never taken anywhere. The complaint into Catherine's alien liaison officer prank didn't reach a conclusion, and Darius Knezovich was arrested off-screen. We also didn't get any reaction from Ryan to his father's death, which would have been interesting. And the huge whip round for Catherine was never given to her. In fact, we saw the Land Rover being driven to the graveyard in the final scene, but we have no idea what was going to happen to Ryan while Catherine was gadavanting around the world. Presumably his Auntie Claire would be taking care of him, but none of this was made clear. So the finale was good in that it delivered the climactic scenes that helped close the main storyline, and the lesser stories were technically given some closure. It's just I would have liked to see more of it played out on screen, rather than be told about it during a quick-fire conversation in the police station. Rather than just an extra ten minutes, it probably needed to be a double-length finale to properly fit in all the scenes that the episode really needed. Then again, maybe this would have been too much of a good thing. I still came away from this episode feeling like I'd watched a great piece of television. Perhaps this season didn't quite hit the heights of the first one, but it still had several scenes that featured some of the best acting and writing that you'll find on TV this year, so it's hard to find too much fault with a slightly rushed ending. My favourite line in this episode came from Ivan, as he was being arrested and he protested, You can't, I'm getting married in two hours. Regular viewers of this channel will know that I've become quite attached to Ivan and Matea and their hapless antics in this series, so I was a bit gutted to see them arrested. That was offset by Ivan's refusal to believe the police would be so cruel as to arrest him just two hours before his wedding. He seemed to think that this wedding offered him some sort of protection against the law, but sadly was mistaken. When Rob Hepworth has been interviewed, the monitor shows the date has been the 23rd of September 2022, which is only just after the end of summer in West Yorkshire, and the weather is typically fairly mild, so it strikes me as a bit strange that Catherine is wearing a scarf in most of her outdoor scenes. You'd expect a police officer of many years to have better home security than Catherine has in her cellar windows, it was very easy for Tommy to break into her house through that flimsy window. 
In fact, the police.uk website has a page about Windows security where it recommends that the windows that can be accessed from the ground floor need extra security. Sally Wainwright, the writer of Happy Valley, has been asked directly in a BBC Newsnight interview if she would consider writing a spin-off series where Ryan is a young police officer. She very clearly stated that this would not happen. It's a shame, as Andy Shepard saying how much he looked like a young recruit seemed to be a nod towards him having a future in the police, but this may have just been a nod to the character's future, not a future series. There are lots of callbacks to earlier episodes in this final episode. Tommy pouring petrol in himself like he's in the season 1 finale. Someone trying to set fire to themselves was also the first job we saw Catherine deal with in the opening episode of season 1. And Tommy forgiving Catherine also echoes how he forgave the priest for snitching on him earlier in this season. Let me know in the comments if you notice any other callbacks in this episode. Amit Shah, the actor who played Faisal, said in an interview with the Obsessed with Happy Valley podcast that he didn't know how the show ended because he filmed his character's ending in multiple possible ways. This makes me wonder if there's an ending filmed where Rob was arrested for Joe's murder, the Knezoviches all get arrested and Faisal gets away with it all. This wouldn't have felt like a fair way to end things, but life isn't fair, and Rob being put in prison for murder would have been a miscarriage of justice that I wouldn't have been too upset about happening. The shot of Tommy Lee Royce peering into the living room while Catherine sleeps quickly became a meme and has been widely shared on social media. I think we can all relate to the Monday morning feeling this picture is describing. Now the series is finished, there aren't any future episodes to worry about, but we can think about what will lie in store for the characters now the story is finished. Here are a few of the questions we will never know the answer to, but I'm curious about anyway. Will Catherine be able to enjoy her retirement away from the police, or will her detective instincts mean she's never truly off duty? I'm not sure she'll be able to properly switch off, even though she's hung up her handcuffs. Will Ryan follow in her footsteps into the police force? His face lit up when Andy Shepard said he genuinely mistook him for a young police officer, and it's fairly common for children to follow into the career of their family members. Will Darius Knezovich really go to prison for the Gary Gagovsky murder? He's notoriously hard to pin any crime on, and Tommy's kitchen confession to Catherine may not hold up in court, as he was at death's door. There were no other witnesses, and he had a taser pointed at him. I think Teflon Darius may get away with that one. There's also the fate of Faisal and Rob to be decided. They both seem to be going to prison for their crimes, but we don't know for sure, or if they will go away for long periods or not. They will never work as a pharmacist or a teacher again, and if the full extent of their crimes becomes known, they will hopefully go to prison for a long time. Then there are the law-abiding cast members that will carry on with their lives, like Richard will no doubt be reporting on the downfall of the Knezovich crime empire, if that actually happens. Claire and Neil will carry on as they are, supporting Ryan into adulthood, Anne Gallagher's PTSD may be slightly better now that Tommy is dead, but trauma doesn't typically work like that, and she may have a long road ahead of her to fully recover from her ordeal back in season one. In many ways, it's a shame we'll never go back to Happy Valley, but it's also a testament to how good the writing is that their characters feel like they'll carry on living their lives, even when the series is finished. Thank you for watching my recap and review of the final episode of Happy Valley. I'll be posting more recap and reviews of upcoming TV series in the near future, so please subscribe to make sure you don't miss them. Goodbye.